Okay, welcome to Epicus, Gamicus, Metallicus. And this is going to be our first show, More Metal Than Metal. I'm Jack. And I'm Sean. Of the dead, right? Of the dead. <laughs> uh, and this week we're going to talk about Nuwabum. Uh, Nuwabum, if you don't know, stands for the new wave of British heavy metal. And it was a period in the late 70s to early 80s where a billion bands started. It, it kind of started more in the mid 70s, kind yeah. of like Motorhead, I'd say. Yeah, Motorhead's really there. Early. Mid late 70s. Kind so of it's kind basically of a new form of metal, like the thing after Black Sabbath, traditional metal, all the blues influences gone. It's pure metal. And all the bands knew they were metal, they said they were metal. Yeah, it's, that's about the point where he gets you when you had bands like, um, well, even before New Album, like Judas Priest, where where they started to really catapult into the the heavy metal scene. Yeah. Where they kind of just dismissed the rock influences, or not the rock influence, but blues influences. Mm-hmm. from That was from rock. Yeah. So you kind of have that transition period. And, and New Album was kind of the end of that tra- transition period. Yeah. I mean... Where metal becomes a new genre. Yeah, pretty much. It's that period. And so for this episode, we're going to do uh, ten, ep- 10 albums, which, which influenced no album, and then we're going to do 10 no album albums of the correct era. Yeah, and we'll kind of do it in the form of a top 10 list. Yes, and, top 10. And we're going to include albums that we think are very important for that scene, and definitely like albums that you should go listen to if you haven't already. Mm-hmm. Uh, so let's get started. Um, I'm gonna go first. My number ten uh, pre new album album is In Rock by Deep Purple. Uh, excellent album. One of the uh, key pre metal, although it's technically 1970, so it's in there. But you it's kind of it's kind of before before metal kind of before it really came popular. Yeah, you know, in the but 1970s. it's it's Deep Purple's uh, first. Hard rock album after they did the classical stuff in the yeah. 60s. First album with Ian Gillen, screaming his head off. <laughs> um, Where he kind of, yeah, he kind of changes his vocal style a little bit, you know? Yeah. You have a little bit difference there. And you, you got songs like Speed King, which is, that's like proto speed metal right there. Speed metal. Yeah, I mean, it's even got the word speed in the title. Yeah, you can't, can't, can't beat that. Yeah. It's yeah, it's definitely definitely I think it's definitely an important album. I think I think um yeah, I got I gotta agree with that one. Um definitely not probably not as not as heavy metal as their later stuff. They kinda of more went down yeah. a more I mean, Grant's a machine head, I mean not the most heavy metal yes. album, but but um it kinda of goes down, you know. To that, so in deep's in oh, I'm sorry, in rock is more of that. Yeah, and we'll talk about that hard rock. Right? Well, a little bit, but but I just thought we'd include it. You know, I think it's mm-hmm. important. You know, to talk about like the later stuff in comparison to in rock too. Yes, in rock's kind of that before period before they really went into a heavy metal direction. You mm-hmm. know, so I think I think that's important. Um, so we'll. So with that that in mind, um, we'll go ahead and go on to the, the my ten. I put Budgie there, um, their self titled album. Um, I think it's a, it's a very important album because it's uh, it re- it really launches into to a new album. Um, really really good album. That's the uh, Welsh contribution there. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, um, I listened to that album. I wasn't. It's good, but I'm just kind of meh about it. Yeah, maybe. I, I just think I think it's an important album. It doesn't have bread fat on it, so... Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I guess that's all we have to say about Budgie. Yeah. Well, there's right. not, not too much to say about it, just kind of an intro, intro and, um, song to so, early metal. I mean, uh, because this list didn't have to be metal, I put Nevermind the Bollocks by the Sex Pistols on it because I love the Sex Pistols. And not metal. Non-metal posers deserve to die. Yeah, because the punk scene was an influence on the album. It gave them Most a, certainly their yeah. DIY their DIY thing, um, and then my box is the quintessential British punk album. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't think you can. I don't think you can get a more punk album like than the yeah. 
sex pistol. Oh, well, never mind the bollocks. Yeah, especially considering they make one album and then broke up. Which is, that's 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 how one, punk works. You just that's bang, just, we're gone. That's just that's what's crazy about the Sex Pistols. Like they have one album, but it's their most popular album. It's one of the most popular punk albums. Yeah, they I are, think of all time. They're probably one of the only bands which have recorded one album and are like on like top level. They are the classic band from their genre. I know. Yeah, I can't. I don't think I can think of any other like band where they've only made one album, where that and that album is like one yeah. of the best in its genre. I Cause, think, yeah. Because most of them knew that they were good, so they recorded a second album. Like imagine if Black Sabbath had just recorded Black Sabbath and then gone, and they just disbanded. Yeah, it's just the, all they made was Black Sabbath. Yeah, this I is don't think. Up. I think if that were to happen, they wouldn't be nearly as influential. Yeah, it'd probably be kind of obscure, wouldn't it? There'd just be some weird album from 1970 that nobody remembers yeah and just yeah I think I think that kind of launched it or I think I think their later albums kind of launched them even more but but um I think I think with that we don't really have a whole lot more to talk about on that album no um, not really because the sound's not really influential it's more of the idea yeah I think the it. idea of, of Nevermind the Bulbs is very influential yeah, may- maybe not so much the sound making your own album on a on a low budget but I think maybe you could say that about a lot of punk rock bands on a new album yeah it's they're kind of very, oh, very, very, very they're influential just kind of in a different sense maybe mm-hmm. like how the music's played maybe yeah. except for maybe like some of like the the fastness a little bit maybe yeah. it was kind of adopted a little bit I think yeah they definitely gave speed to metal yeah, I think I think that's probably what was adopted, you know, mm-hmm. where it, it really uh, really changed. Uh, so you're number nine. So I put very heavy, very humble by very Brad heavy. Heavy. Sorry, it's very heavy, very humble. There we go. <laughs> so do with the right I, accent. Ugh, I can't. I cannot do that accent. Ugh, ugh, cannot do that. They had a very, you know, compared to the other listings we have here, they had a very like disturbing album cover. Oh yeah, it's like a dude dying, like screaming, like dying. Especially considering the um, the uh, the kind of music that they're making, kind of like that progressive rock. Yeah, it's kind of like heavy like, progressive rock. Kind of similar to Rush, but not quite. It's a little bit yeah. different from Rush. They they kind of that's the thing about progressive rock, though. Progressive rock, most of the time, because it's progressive, it, it takes a lot of different directions with the yeah, bands that are in it always heavy sometimes it's lighter sometimes it's heavier sometimes it's yeah and that's what's great heavy. about your riot heat especially very heavy very humble they have very heavy very heavy heavy very heavy however <laughs> don't pronounce the h the h is like not there uh very heavy heavy very no, heavy no. heavy sorry i keep i keep messing that up <laughs> okay. so, i don't know why but i have a hard time with that album but um going back to what i was saying yeah it definitely had that um, that kind of experimental feel to it in some sense. You know, you had different songs, sort of songs. You know, yeah. You know, and it was definitely like when you when you got into the album, it was in some ways kind of surprising because it wasn't what you were expecting to some extent. Yeah. Looking at the album cover, it's just kind of interesting. Especially it starts with the Gypsy, which is a super heavy song, and then some of the other songs aren't really aren't they're more they're, they're just more normal traditional prog music. Yeah, they're they're not you know. They kind of change, yeah. It's definitely, definitely a different kind of album, you know, mm-hmm. from from all the other listings. I yeah. mean, I think, yeah, I, I, I kind of agree. I think compared to Budgie, you know, I think this is this definitely deserves its place in nine mm-hmm. above that, I think. So, uh, number eight. Um, my number eight is another punk album, the self-titled Ramones album. I think we're starting to get a feel of what Jack likes over here. Uh, 70s music? Yes, I like 70s music. <laughs> there we go. It's an excellent period for music. <laughs> so yeah, first Ramones album. I mean, I think mostly for the speed of the Ramones. Pretty big influence on them, like Motorhead and stuff like that. Um, even though the Ramones are technically just a pop band on speed, but they're not really a punk. They don't even like they, they don't have any of the political aspirations of to be, British yeah, punk bands. Kinda, yeah, they're kind of yeah. I have to I have to agree. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted if to you make... compare just if you compare like never mind the bullets and the Ramones, you can kind of see how the Ramones kind of have that more poppy sound in some way. Yeah. Um, that being said, they do have some really good albums. 
or songs on that album. Yeah, that song um, is almost back to back good, 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 good songs on that album. What's What's funny about that album is you kind of have that um, you kind of have those one two minute songs. Yeah, you know, and that's just became a staple to punk. You know. Yeah, that's kind of the point. Just like, yeah, just it just hits you fast, and then it's just that's it. <laughs> it, <laughs> it, just, it hits you fast. The good songs on this album: Flip Street Butt, Beat on the Brad, Judy's a Punk, I Want to Be Your Boyfriend, Change. No, not that one. Now I want to sniff some blue. I don't want to go to the basement. Loud mouth van affair. Fifty third and third. That's like eighty percent of the album is all good songs. And most most of the albums. They kind of have a similar strong structure where you have that yeah. double beat drum kind of mm-hmm. a little bit. Very repetitive. It's all the same songs. Yeah, it has that same rhythm structure in most of the songs. They're a good sing-along band because they're very easy to sing. Oh, the sure. lyrics are interesting. And yeah. And it really gets you into the album with the first, you know, with the first song, Bob. Yeah. You know? Hey, oh, let's, let's go. go. Shoot me in the back, man. <laughs> there we go. All this stuff. Yeah, um... That's got to be the most different song on that album, though, Blitzkrieg Bop, because compared to the other songs on the album. Yeah. Because Blitzkrieg Bop's kind of more about the, the tactic used by the Germans, and then mm-hmm. and then the other songs are just... Happy. Happy-go-lucky, I guess. Yeah. And I guess that's kind of why why you said at the beginning they're kind of a different band from being uh, punk, you know? Yeah. So you're number eight? So I, I put um, Tyranny and Mutation by Blue Oyster Cult. Um, um, if you don't know Blue Oyster Cult, you should. Um, <laughs> they're probably one of the best bands of that that time, like I'm in sorry. the seventies. Wikipedia just oh. asked me if you search for Ramones, would this article be relevant? Oh my god! <laughs> That's the thing about using Wikipedia. It's like it's like oh my god! Come on. Okay. Continue. <laughs> Continue. Um. Yeah, Tyranny and Mutation, very good, very good album by Blue Oyster Cult. I think it came after uh, what was that album? I'm trying. To, I have a I have a hard time remembering some of the albums. Blue, but, um, Blue Oyster Cult. No, no, it was um, it was a different album. God, I can't believe I've, I'm already forgetting. Because I listened to the one before it pretty qu- quickly after. There's only um, a self titled before it. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I was listening. I was listening to both. Um, but I, I included this one on the list just because I think in some ways, I think this one has somewhat heavier sound yeah. to it than the first one. Not saying that the first one's bad, of course, but I think I think this second one, Tyranny Mutation, definitely more more um, going in the harder direction, I think. Definitely, um, definitely I think, more influential on the new album. Kind of yeah. More pushing metal in that direction, kind mm-hmm. of. And I think I think Blue Oyster Cult. The reason I like mentioning them on this list is um, I'm hitting the mic here. Yeah, what's the mic? Oops. <laughs> um, the reason I like to include them on this band is um, you you really get you really get some of the prog rock, hard rock, little mix in with everything, and it's kind of a band that you kind of that if you don't listen to metal. I feel like it's a band you can listen to and be like, you know, that's pretty good. You know, yeah. that's not too bad. You know, it's not like total heavy metal, like someone like Judas Priest or yeah, something. It's, it's just hard rock. It's just yeah, it's kind of, but it mixes in some elements of heavy metal. You know, mm-hmm. where you can kind of see it in there. Yeah. You know, and that's the nice thing about Blue Oyster Cult. You know, it's a good introduction if if you have family members that don't really listen to metal. It's a good introduction. You know, because it's yeah. a more calm album. You know. Uh, okay, so my number seven is self titled Rush album, which I guess it kind of it kind of rides the line between being metal. Probably it's not, not probably quite. probably more hard rock. Not but quite, but it's pretty pretty damn close. Yeah, it's definitely uh, Rush is definitely an album that's that's kind of different from their later work. Yeah, because it's say. no prog in Rush. Yeah, it's really it's just straight. It's hard rock, kinda, yeah. Sort of Zeppelin, much. Zeppelin clone. Oh my god! Why does my computer keep disconnecting me from the internet? Because <laughs> the internet sucks. Yes. Um, the internet here's but yeah, Rush. Uh, basically, that was a period where Rush was just a Canadian Zeppelin, minus the prog. <laughs> yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I think Rush really. Um, Rush really uh, went more prog after that album. Definitely, um, like. Um, I think Neil Peart started doing more. Work yeah, because they had Neil Peart. And then. Yeah, they, he kind of brought the band more progressive direction, which I think is good because I think, you know, um, 
I think it's definitely more interesting. Like, yeah, they um, couldn't keep. You know, Rush is a great album, but they probably couldn't have done a second one that well. Yeah, I think I think I think um, run out if, they continue, if they continued with that, they would have just they would have run out of ideas and it'd be the same thing over and over and over. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think you know it's a good it's a good beginner album for Rush. Yeah, but I think their later work really establishes their uh, credentials. Yeah. in a uh, hard rock, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so. I think Rush is an important album. Um, I agree with your listing on that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we'll go to my seven. Um, I picked the Stooges debu- debut album. Yeah. After I asked you to. <laughs> yeah, I actually had um funny funny story. I actually had a fun house on this first because he had um earlier he had the Stooges on his list, and we kind of he kind of decided to switch things around. So I was like, okay. So I went back and listened to the Stooges again. Like before I listened to, uh, after I listened to Funhouse, I was like, in comparing the albums, even though Funhouse, as great as an album as that is, um, it's kind of like it kind of has like a mix where it's kind of sounds strange. Yeah, you know? in the case, it's kind of weird. It's, it's kind of strange. I think the Stooges is more of a safer bet. Yeah. To me, to me, because it has more of that early rock, maybe punk rock feel to yeah, it. Proto, you know? proto punk. Proto punk. Yeah, that proto punk feel. You know. And that's you know obviously the Stooges launch, launched um, punk rock as it is. Yeah. But um, I think I think the Stooges debut album probably does that more than Funhouse. And it's definitely got uh, the the classic songs on it. Nineteen sixty nine, No Fun, I Want to Be Your Dog. Yeah, definitely more more. Um, and the distortion on I Want to Be Your Dog is very influential to metal. You can really oh, yeah it. yeah um, Stooges very important band. Um, yeah, it was kind of unfortunate they kind of disbanded for quite a while. Yeah, yeah. but I mean, Iggy Pop made some good stuff. So that's true. Yeah, I mean that's true. I think Iggy Pop did a pretty good solo but, career. But um, yeah, Stooges definitely a great album. Definitely something I would check out. Um, I don't think I don't think we have any disagreements on that album. Nope. Um, yeah, because I think that's yeah a very good album. Unlike good. the next album. So when I told Sean I was putting a live out on the list, he's like, you're doing what? <laughs> I, was, I was surprised. Yeah. So uh, it's Strangers in the Night by UFO. Um, and I really picked it because there isn't really a standout UFO album from the 70s. I might pick, I'm a big fan of uh, one of their later albums called The Monkey Puzzle. But that's not for like, that's not till like 2003 or something like that. So Yeah. But, but so Strangers in the Night, uh, UFO is my dad's favorite band, and I asked him, what did he think, should I use a studio album or should I use a live album? He's like, you should definitely go for this Strangers in the Night, because it's a classic um, live album. And it's really the only live album that I care about, uh, mainly because it's got a really funny bit in the middle, where uh, there's just like a pause in the show, I think they had to replace the mic, and the, sing- the singer gets a message saying, uh, can you fill in? And he's like, don't know what can I fill in means. Yeah. Tell a few jokes, uh, possibly reveal myself. It's, it's hilarious. <laughs> oh man, what a, yeah. what a classic act! Yeah, um, I was just, I was just, I wasn't expecting that. Like when I was, when I was looking through his album list, I was like, you included a live album on this? What? Yeah. I'm like, what? I was, I was just like, I remember looking it up, and I was like, this isn't a studio album. This isn't a studio album. Yeah. Like what, what is this? But it does mean you get all of the classic '70s UFO songs on it. I guess a lot of the early UFO albums kind of had like one or two hits, and then yeah. the rest were just kind of more filler. And I did make sure it does have Michael Shanker on it. Oh which, yeah, that's important. Which is relevant for later. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, I think that was a fair addition though. The live album of that. Yeah. I think that's fair. You right. know, uh, and with all the argument that I gave you here about it, <laughs> I'll. I guess I'll forgive that one. Yeah, okay. So you're number six? Um, I put um, 2112. Yeah, back Or as I, I like to call it in the past before Jack made fun of me. 2112. 2112. It's a year. Do you pronounce it 2112? <laughs> I'm ready for when, when that year comes. I'm just going to go, guys, it's, two, it's year 2112. <laughs> just the New Year's Eve party. Or, or just before that, be like, it's year 2111. Yeah, if you live to be that old. Cause I'll probably I'll be around, be, but that would be what, sad, I, man. I won't be, I'll, I'll be here for the year that yeah, I know, We're only just going to miss it, too, because it's only like... I know, right? 100 and... It's 
95 years. All my, all my years and ambitions crushed, destroyed. Yeah. It's like you, <laughs> die, you die in December of 2111. Just like, no! <laughs> No. Okay, enough joking. Okay, okay. So let's talk about okay. the actual <laughs> album. <laughs> okay, so um, 21, 21, 12, um Just the album just after uh, "Flight in the Night." Fly by night. Oh, fly by night. Sorry, fly by night. Was it still? I can't remember. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was still um still a new prog album. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's the first of their prog albums where they really figured it out. Yeah, it's actually it was actually Graft Aggressive Steel. But wasn't that neat that the thousand? They're about the same years. years so. Oh yeah, I guess so. Yeah, oops. But twenty five is but the first program where they really got sorted out. The the two between twenty one twelve and Rush were a bit weird. Yeah, I guess so. But twenty one twelve is all good songs, and of course the epic twenty one twelve on the A side. Oh yeah, yeah. Twenty one twelve is definitely a step, like a step where where um, yeah, they really did. Of course, the de- the the title song, yeah, longest with the like sub songs in it. Mm-hmm. Um, Seven songs in it. <laughs> it's all pretty, um, especially like "Passage to Bangkok." That's a pretty that's a pretty heavy song for this yeah. album. I, I have to say, um, com- especially compared to like everything else on mm-hmm. it. I would um, I would actually say that I prefer Hemispheres, but Twenty One Twelve kind of laid the groundwork for Hemispheres, so it's probably yeah. a better choice. Yeah, I think twenty one twelve. Um, another funny story. Um, this was actually uh, some, I don't know how many people know this, but actually, but like all the all the lyrics and stuff for this stuff was actually based on Ayn Rand. If you know who that is, on the book. Well, um, Atlas struggled. Yeah, or Atlas shrugged. Sorry, it was kind of based on Ayn Rand. So, so um, you did get some controversy from that from that album, but um. But um, uh, aside from that, you know, you got a really good prog album, you know, and definitely had, you know, so you kind of you kind of understand the story behind yeah. the album. You kind of get the mm-hmm. content. And it's song definitely song the sort of thing that they were listening to at the. Um, if you ever heard of the, the Sound House, was basically it was like a metal club in London around the time, and they just played like ACDC, Judas Priest, all that stuff. Yeah, and that was where most of the new album bands. That's where they got played. They got played on the rotation there and oh, actually yeah. they actually eventually started releasing a um like a, a chart of what was the most played thing at the sound house and that was like more important than anything else for metalheads in the early 80s that was all oh, men that was the big stuff right there that's a lot uh so number five yeah yeah let's see my number five is rainbow rising by rainbow the band uh, Richie Blackmore started after he left Deep Purple, and also the first band, the first major band that included Dio, minus all his fifties rock and roll stuff and then Elf and all that nonsense. It was the first good Dio band, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, Rainbow Rising, I think, is their second album, because the first album's a little iffy, but it's got a lot of classic songs. It's got, I mean, it's got Starbreaker on it. The Starbreaker. Starbreaker or Star... No, wait, that's a Judas Priest song. So, like, so Star- Starbreaker, so they, like, Geezer. break the star. How do they do that? Like, how do they break the star? It's called fantasy. Use your imagination. <laughs> no, actually, so, sorry, Starbreaker is a Judas Priest song. This this album has the, the song Starstruck and the song Stargazer. I can just imagine them, like, getting their hands and just, like, crushing, yeah. crushing the star. Like, <laughs> imagine that, like... They're burning their hands while crushing the star. Star crusher. Yeah. <laughs> but Starbreaker. Yeah, so Rainbow Rising is kind of like the f- the first proto power metal album, with all it's got all the fantasy elements and all that stuff, and like uh, classical elements and Richie Blackmore doing weird Eastern guitar <laughs> stuff. I feel that classic album. I'm feeling it. I'm, I'm feeling that. Your number five. Definitely a good choice. <laughs> um, de- you know, and um, one other thing I'd like to add to that, um, definitely a precursor to a little bit of their later work too. They kind of, they kind of, con- I think they kind of did a continuation from um, Rainbow Rising on Yeah on Live Rock. I'm, I'm not a big fan of that. I think they pushed too far into the um, radio rock stuff they started doing in the '80s, which I like the stuff they did in the '80s. 
but I don't want to hear Dio singing that stuff. That's for Jolene Turner and whoever the other guy is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, well let's each out. Anyway, um, we'll, we'll go ahead and go on to my five. Um, we're kind of we're kind of wasting a lot of time talking yeah, about these it's albums. The Alice Cooper but, um, album. Yeah, the Alice Cooper album. Um, we have to. I feel like we have to include Alice Cooper. I mean, yep. there's. I don't think there's any way you can mm-hmm. pre anything. I don't think you can uh, pre rock anything. You know, rather be metal or rock. Yeah, you, you can't not include. And the, the album you picked was "Love It to Death," third album by Alice, by the Alice Cooper band. Yes, the actual band. Before he turned into a solo act, which most yes. people don't realize that there's a distinction. It's actually two Alice Coopers. Yeah, it's interesting. It's kind of hard to tell the difference. Yeah, but it's kind of um, stupid. He broke up the band, but because his name was Alice Cooper, he got to keep the name. So that's like. It's kind of weird, yeah. yeah it's kind of strange. One of the benefits of starting a name using Europe, starting a band and also being called the name of the band. Yeah. It's the same thing Marilyn Manson could do that if he wanted to. If he just wanted to yeah. leave, he could. And he'd still be so, Marilyn Manson. So, I, I, I just want to talk about the uh, the album a yeah. little bit. Um, so, this was after like their first two albums, which, which uh, their first two albums, they were okay, but not really that spectacular. Yeah. This is the album I think that really like brought them to hard rock, that really brought them into the spotlight a little mm-hmm. bit more, because um, it definitely it definitely catapulted them more in the hard rock direction. And it has their first hit single, I'm yes. Yeah. Uh, oh, 18. I very much enjoyed that song when I was eighteen. Oh yeah, you can imagine I did too. Yeah, you gotta listen to it when you're eighteen. If you oh, yeah. if you've passed eighteen and you've never heard the song, then you you have wasted the opportunity, right? You've completely wasted. Like, yeah. No, no, you you you're, you're done. Like there's there's nothing you else. Can't, you can't go back. Can't go back. Can't no no. Um. So what's funny is I think Anthrox actually covered that in their first album too. Mm-hmm. I'm eighteen. So very important song. Um. Very very important. Um. Actually, you want to know something funny? Mm-hmm. Um. Jack knows this, obviously. I actually put the name of the song as the title on on uh, the chart that we have. And oh, Long Way to Go? Yes. And I was like, uh, Sean, this no Alice Cooper album called Long Way to Go. I was like, you're crazy. And then I went and looked up. I was like, oh, oh my God, I'm the idiot. I put, I put the song instead of the actual title. But that's probably, I think the reason I put that, though, is because that's probably one of the more memorable tracks on that album. Yeah. But, um. I think Black Juju is a pretty important song as well. Um, kind of more of a ballad, a little bit. Um, but I think there's a lot. There's a lot of important songs on that. Um, so you kind of get um, you kind of get um, a lot of uh, mix, you know, with that, you know. So I think we can go ahead and move on. What number we at? We're at number four. Yeah. Uh, my number four is "Fly to the Rainbow" by Scorpions. And guess what? Uh, Michael Schenker's back. Oh no, he's not. Never mind. Never mind. Take that back. No, Michael Schenker. I thought Michael Schenker was in this. Was in the Scorpions at this period. I guess not. Anyway. Oh, that's okay. Actually, he he's not. He doesn't play on the album, but he did help write one of the songs. But anyway, so Fly to the Rainbow, probably one of the more underrated Scorpions albums. One yeah, of the early albums, yeah, but definitely. Uh, it's one of the ones my dad has, so it's, I listen to it a lot. And it's it's a really interesting album because it's kind of got a bit of a almost proto punk feel to it. Some of the yeah, songs kind of yeah, a little bit faster. I can kind of see it. Yeah, I can kind of see it. Uh, it's a very weird album for nineteen seventy four. It's definitely weird compared to some of their later work too, in some ways. Yeah, I have to say because it, it does kind of sound different a little bit. It was kind of a different sound to it than some of their later work, you know. Obviously, the things like Animal Magnetism, Love Drive, Blackout, things like that. Yeah, definitely a lot different from those. Definitely sets it apart. Um, yeah, I think it's a very important album. Um, very good choice. So I did. I did think Michael Schenker was on that album, but I guess he was only in the first Scorpions album. And then Mike Michael Schenker is always entertaining because sometimes he's in my, he's in. Uh, Scorpions, and then he's in UFO, and then he's off in MSG, and he's on all those crazy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's. Oh man, yeah, yeah. Good album. Um, mm-hmm. Not much to say. Not much to say on that one. Yeah, you're number four. Yeah, yeah, I'm number four. 
So um, we're going to move on to a band that's kind of underrated, at least in my opinion. Um, I'd say unknown. Unknown. I've never heard of Buffalo before. Yeah, I, I'd say they're underrated because I think this is this is a great album in my opinion. Um, um, so my album for number four is Volcanic Rock by a band called Buffalo, and they're they're a band from Australia, and they're actually before ACDC. Weirdly, they're called Buffalo. There are no Buffalo in Australia. <laughs> I know, right? It's kind of it's kind of weird. Yeah, it's kind of a weird weird now. Um, but yeah, it's definitely um, it's. Very, very um. I don't know. If, I don't know if you like taking a real listen to it, but it's very um. In some ways, kind of like um. It's heavy metal, but you you kind of get like um. In some like I'm trying to think of like, like how to how to say it. Like you get some other feel, like some other like song feels to it. You know. Mhm. It's kind of it's kind of an odd album because uh you you kind of it's that heavy metal, but you got some you got some influence that. Would later kind of sound be the sound of some other, other uh, subgenres of metal. You yeah. Know? There you go. So, what are you gonna say? It's foreshadowing. Yeah, kind of. There we go. Um, I can think of the word that way. Yeah. So I, I think Buffalo is a very important band because it you know it influenced ACDC, and you know, um, very 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 important band. Um, Obviously, Shylock was uh, the single kind of from this album. That's the most memorable song off this album. Mm-hmm. Um, very good, very good song. Um, then you got like the song. Uh, those are some of the songs that, that that was one of the songs that stood out to me. There's also some yeah. nice come my way. Um, what's funny is um, this album kind of got um, controversy for being misogynistic because of the album cover. Hmm. Cause um I don't know if you if you've seen the album cover it's like um it's like a, the it's like this androgynous figure holding up like this phallic symbol I, yeah. I was like I was pretty much reading this off Wikipedia weird it is it's kind of a weird it is kind of a weird album cover it's kind of strange mm-hmm. um what's funny is like their later their later work well their later work's not as important in my opinion as this album um. It's kind of funny. Their late the the album after that was really like like it really they took that to an extreme. Like mm-hmm. after that, it's just kind of funny. It's kind of funny. They just they just took it and they're just like, all right, we're just gonna roll with it. Okay, they're just like whatever. <laughs> yeah. So um, before I do number three, I just want to make sure that you really want your number one to be your number one. Oh yeah, of course. You want you still want that there. Oh, you're, 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 man, there's no way I'm getting rid of my number one. Okay, don't say what it is, though. Anyway, so number three, and we're really getting into the meat of the pre album stuff, is Black Sabbath by Black Sabbath. The one, the only, the originator of heavy metal, right? Oh, yeah. For sure. Yeah, I can't disagree with that. I feel like some people kind of put the first first Black Sabbath album down, but... I mean, maybe because it doesn't have any of the classics of Paranoid, but it's still a really strong album. Yeah, I, I do agree. It's it's a very important album, most certainly. Um, you know, you have you obviously have Black Sabbath, you have The Wizard, things like that. And then all um, I think a lot of people mixed together. I think a lot of people may put it down because of the blues influences the album has and the jazz influence. Yeah, and it's kind of in. And in a lot of metal people's eyes, you're yeah. like, yeah, it's not really metal. But the drumming on that album is so cool. He's like, he's got his weird jazz beats going on and everything like that. Yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely a more interesting album. Yeah, in, in some ways, you know, in that sense. And also the originator of doom metal, obviously. Yeah, you know, um, yeah, it's. I, I wouldn't criticize it because of those reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I can kind of see it. You know, you kind of have a more blues lose level of music you know yeah. you don't have that uh, that kind of sound to mm-hmm. it so your number three um so I put my number three as Machine Head by Deep Purple um I know we we're, were talking about that when we are talking about in rock because Machine yeah. Head Machine Head is it's the classic Deep Purple album yes it's the album that it's I it's a bit say. like it's the paranoid to uh in rock's Black Sabbath really yes 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 um yeah, it's definitely the album most people remember from Deep Purple. So um, worry about Fireball. 
Yeah, well, <laughs> it's in between for a while. But um, yeah, it's definitely the album people remember. Um, it has obviously "Smoke on the Water," the one mm-hmm. song that like everybody plays whenever they play the I guitar. I hate that song. Time. And that's mainly why I put in rock and not machine head. It's because I just I don't like the Deep Purple unknown for "Smoke on the Water," which is just a stupid riff song when they're pretty much a prog band. Like Deep Purple's about crazy uh, Richie Blackmore fighting the John Lord, like keyboards versus Could guitar. Fear, yeah, it is a lot different from their later work, but it's an important song I think because yeah. you know I think I think you know you have that simple riff and it's definitely something that um, a lot of people can. Um, a lot of people, you know, take that song and they're able to learn guitar through yeah. that, you know. Um, I prefer Highway Star. I, I do agree. Yeah, I think Highway Star is probably my favorite off the album. Because that's definitely the more heavy metal song. Yeah. It, always, it always annoyed me that, that Rock Band, for Rock Band 3, when they introduced the keyboard, they used Smoke in the Water. It's like, what? I want to play a proper Deep Purple song on the keyboard. not <laughs> any, cause, And of course, because Highway Star was in the first game, there's no keyboard support for it. So there's no way to play like a real Deep Purple song on keyboards on Rock Band, which really pisses me off. Cause <laughs> I, I think we're, we're now, now we're knowing why he hates this album. Yeah. Because <laughs> like, this, this is the Highway Star. A lot of people probably think it's a guitar-based song, but half of that song is uh, Hammond organ. On the, yeah, the, yeah, the, the Highway Star, yeah. Yeah, it's um, definitely an important song on that album, I think. I think the rest of the songs are more... How do you say hard rock? Yeah, and there's there's some other interesting songs on there, like the is it Pictures of Home? Yeah, that's, that's a good a song, underrated song. Which it's got that. Like, it does. It feels like you're up on a mountain and stuff. It's, I think it, it kind of foreshadows some of the rainbow stuff. Yeah, kind of. I think so. Yeah. Uh, so my number three. my number two. Um, bit late, but the classic. Highway to Hell by ACDC. And, and we had a big argument about this when we were setting the show up that uh, ACDC weren't metal. And, um, oh, man. And so at the beginning, I kind of thought they were metal, but now I've kind of come around to the idea that they're not because of the way sh- the songs are structured. They are structured basically they, they, the same as a rock and roll song. Yeah. They just play it, just it a bit heavier. It's, it's kind of the same with like Led Zeppelin. I don't yeah, know what, like there's I people think, that consider Led Zeppelin to be heavy metal I think to a lesser extent with Led Zeppelin because like every ACDC song has the distortion it's got a loud yeah, sound maybe, to it maybe but yeah maybe. and I my thing with uh, AC, my thing with ACDC is I'm not a big fan of the 80s ACDC when they were really popular oh uh, yeah I think they were better in the 70s um with uh was it John Bonham no that's is that, who's, the, who's the vocalist for uh, ACDC? I don't remember. Oh, Bon Scott. I know, they, they used Axl Rose for the lead oh, singer. Oh, don't get me started. <laughs> oh, man. Why is it Axl Rose? So all people. Like, all the people they could have asked. Like, all people. So, um, so we I'm don't, sorry, we're, we're getting off. Yeah, so we live in Texas, right? And Texas actually, for some weird reason, has a lot of ACDC tribute bands. And there's one, I think the best ACDC tribute in the world is from Texas. Uh, I think they're called Back in Black. And their vocalist sounds pitch perfect the same as Brian Johnson. So you're like, and he actually went over to Australia to audition to uh, fill Brian, Brian Johnson's shoes for a bit. And they picked Axl Rose. What? Like, and that guy, like, if you went and saw him, if you didn't know what Brian Johnson looked like and you didn't know that he was sick, you would have thought it was him singing because it sounds just like him. I know, right? Yeah, it's kind of sad. Yeah. It's just and like... The other guy I thought they should have got is if anybody's heard of the band Airborne, they're basically just an ACDC clone But a few uh, years ago. We're getting off, man. It's like, we're really getting yeah, off. Sorry. But, yeah. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, how would it help? Lots of good songs. Yeah, a lot, a lot of good uh, the, what ACDC is known for. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and say every song on that album is great. So it's a long your, list, but yeah, I think, I think that's not totally two. wrong. Um, I put paranoid actually. For I put paranoid actually. Um, yeah. Has he been there somewhere, right? Yeah, I guess so. Um, it's definitely, it's definitely um, more. They're more, or 
pro- I would say I think it's more popular than Black Sabbath. Oh, definitely. Well, yeah, I mean, just just Iron Man based on and them. Paranoid alone. Oh yeah, are more popular. Not to mention War Pigs. Oh, War Pigs. I mean, too. Oh yeah, Pre- like that's three out of like the eight and songs on that album. Planet Caravan is relatively popular. Covered yeah. by Pantera. Um, <laughs> that's side A. Very exciting. Side B, not so much. Good songs on side, side B, but not so popular. Side B, yeah, unfortunately. Um, see, um, Electric Funeral is actually one of my favorite songs on this album. Yeah, but I feel yeah. like only Metalheads would like Electric Funeral. It's just... Yeah, I think it so. It doesn't really work in a mainstream context, but it is... Maybe. A, that's also my favorite Black Sabbath yeah, song, so... Yeah. Um, I like Side B a lot, too, but... Yeah, yeah and Hand of Doom, Hand of Doom, great song. Yeah. Um... Yeah, um, there are some people who kind of like um, Master of Reality more, but I just really like this album. Yeah, they're all the Doom guys. They think that's the proto-Doom album. Then. Yeah, um, don't get me wrong, it's a great album, um, but I think I have to say I prefer this album. It's not Paranoid, right? Yeah, it's not Paranoid. It's just not, it's okay. just not Paranoid. So you know? we're going to throw out our honorable mentions now, I think? Um, yeah, we can go ahead and do okay. that. Um, so mine were... The self-titled Van Halen album. It's probably the right period to be in one, but obviously Van Halen are American and they're not really the same sort of sound. But I think it's a great album. Yeah, I think Van Halen, like especially after like their debut and stuff, they kind of went started going more and yeah, more they into just, just rock, mainstream, mainstream, mainstream all the way down. Yeah, and then um, the other one is Led Zeppelin Four because obviously a Led Zeppelin album has to be in here. Yeah, we have to. And, uh, obviously, uh, when the levee breaks. Um, classics and we should also point out that we're recording this during basically during Hurricane Irma right oh yeah it's going, still going on in Florida right now and obviously we just got hit by uh, Hurricane Harvey yeah just a couple weeks ago oh yeah oh man the poor souls that got hit by that man yeah it sucks but yeah. when the levee breaks very appropriate song for right now yeah and yeah I can't say I disagree <laughs> The right, levee's so certainly broken here. Yeah. At least at least in Houston and those other cities. And uh, Corpus, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's probably... Oh, man, good luck for Florida. Um, anyone, anyone listening from Florida, good luck over there, man. Um, hope, you, hope your house survived, right? Yeah, I hope so, man. I really hope so. So your honorable mention? Um, so I put In a God of Vita by Iron Butterfly. In a God um, of Vita, baby. Don't you know that I'm the... I feel like most people probably forget that that's an album. Yes, there is that 20-minute song on there, but there's also some other tracks on there. But. Yeah, but let's be, let's be honest. The reason it's an honorable mention, I'll say, is that as important as a song as it is, and the album too, In a God, the Vita, um, it's a rock song. Yeah. It's a blues rock. Mm-hmm. It's definitely. Now, In a God, the Vita has that heavy sound heavy. that would, that it's, would it's be important. It's proto-metal. Yes. It would be important for the development of metal. And in fairness, this the album came out in '68, so for '68, it was pretty fucking heavy. Yeah, it was for sure. Um, it, it was it was definitely going into that that um, that period, you know. Mm-hmm. So it was definitely it was definitely moving on to that, you know. So I think it's a very important album. I think it deserves an honorable mention. The thing I was just remember, for that alone. The thing I always remember about it, I think there was a scene in The Simpsons where Bart slips in the. Uh, the, the music for it in church and the poor woman on the organ is sitting there playing it for 17 minutes in a good yeah, she just play, and then just collapses at the end oh yeah oh, and I think I think actually he actually slipped in the um, the song lyrics as well so they were all singing in a God of Vida. <laughs> it's hilarious oh, that's pretty funny yeah um, so that's our honorable mentions we are at the number one album and of New course World. Uh, Judas Priest are my favorite band, so they have to be at number one. And for New Album, they are the band that started New Album, basically. Killing Machine. Yeah, Killing Machine, which uh, was released in America as Hellman for Leather, because apparently you can't have an album called Killing Machine here. But I think during that period, you kind of had, because I think Mel has always kind of had that, I mean, this could be maybe for another episode, but we've always kind of had that problem with censorship and metal. Yeah. At least in early metal, where it's kind of hard to... I mean, yeah, Judas Priest had that problem with them playing songs backwards. and like, oh, it makes people commit suicide. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. That's such a stupid... 
Yeah. It's so stupid. Like, they, they not, come up with the dumbest arguments. That's true. We'll probably have to, we need to yeah, do, like, a separate episode yeah, that's talking about, about that. that. But, God. But, yeah, Killing Machine, so uh, it's got the song Held in Flow, which popularized the leather look uh, for metal. Yeah. Uh, it's also got some uh, lesser known songs. Obviously, the title track, Killing Machine, is pretty good. It's got a Fleetwood Mac cover, which is weird, but <laughs> yeah. Fun. It's definitely odd. You know? um, but I would say it's probably odd for some of the covers on Black Sabbath, but they're important songs. Like that evil one. It shows where, it, yeah. Well, that's only in the British version, though, so. Yeah, it's true. If you're American, you got to go look that up if you've never heard the song. It's kind yeah, of that's right. But I think um, Weevil <laughs> Woman's on, um, I have a, I have the special soundtrack of, uh, what was it, Master of Reality? Mm-hmm. I think, I think it's on that, on that album, so. Yeah. There's ways of getting it, but and then um, Killing Machine also has "Take on the World," which is uh, sort of a stadium anthem, which is kind of forgotten. It was never, never really was popular, so it's just sort of been left um, in the pages of history, right? There we go. It's been forgotten. All right, so your number one. Still, still not sure why it's your number one, but go ahead. I put, I put in the court of the Crimson King. I, it's. I'm not saying it's not important, but how is it more important than Black Sabbath or Judas Priest? I, I think it's what catapulted metal. It's what okay. really, it's really, I mean, it's such an influential album. I think it's such a great, like, it has such great work on it. I think it's not, like, the best work of all time. I think it's one of the best albums of all time. Yeah. I, I, I'd argue. and I think it's I a bit think, overrated, but that's just me. I just, I totally disagree. I think it's such a great album, you know. It's what I mean. It's what started. It's really. I would say that's really what started transition into heavy metal. Yeah. That 1969 album. And uh, I mean, the main reason I think so already is because if you go on 4chan, they, they like to big up that album a lot. It's one of their favorites. Maybe, but 4chan overhypes everything. They're they're 4chan doesn't make any sense. Yeah, they're they're kind of weird. But yeah, you do have you got 21st Century Schizoid Man, Court of the Crimson King. Yeah, both good you have, um, you have some really good ballads on that album too. It also um, gave us um, one of the best Kanye songs, Power. Um, That's the one that uses 21st Century Good Sweat Man, I think. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, and it's that, definitely definitely yeah. a very good album. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the best albums, I think. I, I, I You may disagree with me, but I, I'm, I'm keeping it, man. I think, yeah. I think it's definitely one of the most important albums. I think it has like really good work on it, and I think it's very important All right. for the development of heavy mm-hmm. metal. I think it deserves to be a number one. Yeah. Number one, pre noir And I'm thinking, we're about to hit 50 minutes here. I think maybe stop now and have the next part as another episode. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll go ahead. I think we'll include new album as a new episode. Yeah, we'll um, yeah I think we really, we really spent so much time talking about pre noir yeah. album. Because there's a lot to talk about, I think, about some of those albums. Yeah. There's, there's quite a bit. And we do not want an episode which is an hour and a half long. So. Yeah. So um, we'll go ahead and end it there. That's, we'll, do, uh, we'll do our next episode on new album. It's Jack and Sean out from More Metal Than Metal here on Epicus Gamicus Metallicus. Goodbye.